Hey guys, Chris here, and I'm a Ukrainian Canadian. Today is January 22nd, 2024. And let's get to the news happening in Ukraine. And today I will start with the United States. And also after that, I will make a small map update. But this is surely a head scratching, head scratching news because yesterday Putin signed a decree declaring the sale of Alaska to the United States as illegal. And that was the sale of 1867, so over 150 years ago. So I must imagine that Putin probably got prescribed some very good stuff in his bunker uh, to sign a decree mentioning that this sale was illegal. And he's probably been spending way too much time in his bunkers rewriting his history. This is not the first time that Putin is trying to rewrite history into his own liking. Um, and what is really important, aside from all the jokes here, is the fact that this really showcases to you guys the mindset of Russia and Putin's regime. Do you really think that if Ukraine was to sign a peace treaty with, with Russia, some sort of deal on the negotiating table, that Russia would abide, that Russia would actually follow and respect what was signed on that you know, piece of paper? <laughs> Especially when you see stories like that where Putin decides 150 years later, certain treaties or certain purchases are not legal anymore, right? So whatever treaty is signed with Russia, is worth less than toilet paper. Toilet paper is worth way more than what Russia signs in terms of deals, treaties with other nations. And I think this is really important to highlight here. Um, and so additionally, we know that <laughs> if we were to, in some alternative universe, if Russia was to attack Alaska and try to take it back, it would end very badly for them. Alaska has over 750,000 Americans, some of the biggest patriots of the country, um, uncharted territory, and also the United States has military bases and also very likely to have nuclear weapons in Alaska. So this is just not going to fly. And let's remember as well, historically speaking, the reason why Russia sold Alaska to the United States is because the Tsar at that time who lost the Crimean War, which was catastrophic for the Russian Empire, was hemorrhaging cash and he needed cash very quickly. And Alaska, being that it was barely settled by Russians. It had no value at that point for the Russian um, monarchs. Essentially, they decided to sell it for over $7 million. So it was also a very legal purchase. And, you know, I would equate this uh, scenario to, you know, your family over 150 years ago purchasing a home. And then it was passed on to, you know, generations to generations. And then now you're the owner of this house. And then some people start knocking on your door saying that they're, you know, the family members of that original family that sold the house and now they want it back and they say that well the sale was illegal and we actually want it back right how ridiculous would that be and that's exactly the same scenario here um but as this article mentions it just uh really shows kremlin's new approach to international politics and its respect for agreements which there is absolutely zero and you cannot expect russia to be honest unfortunately that is the situation um, so that's the first story, and now let's talk a little bit about Zelensky turning the tables on Putin, especially when we're talking about rewriting history, which Putin likes to do a lot. So what I liked here is that Zelensky essentially put new measures to safeguard the national identity of Ukrainians living in Russia. Essentially, he mentioned that on the territories of the Russian Federation, which were historically inhabited by Ukrainians, we want to safeguard uh, their national identity and their rights, which is an excellent move by Zelensky, essentially turn the tables on what Russia's playbook, uh, what has been mainly Russia's playbook, essentially saying, well, we're invading this nation because we're protecting our national people, you know, our national interests and protecting our people from Russophobia. Well, why can Ukraine do that? Because there's a hell of a lot of Ukrainophobia phobia, phobia in, uh, in Russia. And unfortunately, um, you know, there's a lot of Ukraine people been mistreated, whether it be kidnapped kids or prisoners of war or other Ukrainian people living in Russia and having to be silent because they're fearful of what's going to happen to them and hiding their identities. That is certainly happening in Russia as well. And so I think it's also time for a lot of other nations to make these types of claims as well. What Japan, Chechnya, Georgia, Finland... You know, there's a lot of nations that could just turn the tables on Putin and say, you know what? Actually, 
over 100 years ago, over 100, 200 years ago. Well, this wasn't, you know, uh, fair. We want it back, right? Why not? Put Putin and Russia seem to enjoy playing history and, you know, claiming things um, that they feel was a bad deal hundreds of years ago. So why can other countries do that on Russia with their actions? So that is uh, the two stories I wanted to share with you guys. Now, I want to go over the map. Um, and there have been a few changes. And one really important one is from yesterday. So we have an update in Kharkiv region. So this is less good news um, for the Ukrainians. So you can see this uh, hamlet called Khromalne, a very small village. Probably less than 100 people live here. You can see it's just kind of two roads of settlements. And the Russians managed to take uh, this territory here. So between Khromalne and Tabaevka, essentially they took control over this road. You can see their gains from a few days ago. So this was under Ukrainian control. And the Russians seem to have done a big offensive here. They've gained some ground uh, around this area, which is very surprising because, again, I've mentioned over you know many months that this area really didn't move much. It was very small gains here and there. Um, so I'm hoping that the Ukrainians will be able to do some sort of counterattack here and push back the Russians out of this road. It's very possible, again, this is an open field. So I can understand that sometimes it's difficult to hold the line everywhere. And let's not forget that the Ukrainians as well have to sacrifice ammunition and shells. So sometimes the Russians can utilize that to their advantage and shell the hell out of a certain position, uh, whether it be northern Ukraine or southern Ukraine, and try to pour as many troops as possible. So I keep you guys updated um, in terms of this, uh, the updates here, uh, but it certainly doesn't look good. So hopefully the Ukrainians will be able to hold the line around Khromalne because this is the way essentially to Kupiansk. They most likely will try to start driving up uh, to head towards other villages that are uh, very close to Kupiansk. So we'll see. Um, additionally, again, the Russians are putting a lot of pressure in um, Bakhmut. Essentially, here you can see that the, the map has not changed that much. Um, most of the Russian offensive right now is around Bogdanivka. You can see that there's three different offensives going on around the village of Bogdanivka. It gets the Russians closer to Chasivyar, uh, which is an important uh, city that the Ukrainians are holding to resupply their forces in the vicinity and the suburbs of Bakhmut. So for the Ukrainians, they absolutely need to hold the line around here. Bogdanivka, Kalinivka, uh, Grigorivka. These are very important villages for Ukraine to hold. So hopefully Ukraine will be able to um, hold the majority of the settlement. But you can see that the Russians have already entered sort of the um, about control 5 to 10 percent of Bogdanivka. So this is one Russian push. Another one is in the south of Bakhmut around Kishivka. And you can see that this has remained unchanged for the last two, three weeks. Uh, there are several pushes, but the Russians, again, are trying to take the town of or the village, I should say, of Kishivka. So I'll keep you guys again updated as to what's going to happen with Bakhmut. Uh, but so far, more or less, the situation is being controlled by Ukraine. But there's more and more reports that it's very, very difficult fighting in Bakhmut. And you can see mainly because of the amount of troops that Russia is throwing. The meat waves don't end. And this is one of the complaints by uh, the Ukraine forces that no matter how many Russians, the Ukrainians kill, there's always more coming and it's truly like a zombie wave. Uh, so it is exhausting. You guys must understand that for the Ukrainians, um, they're doing everything possible against a really zombie minded uh, army, right? They're absolutely OK with dying, um, even if it's for gaining one meter, two meters. That's that's the reality that the Ukrainians are facing. And additionally, uh, let's go into the last um, update is in, is in Avdivka. So in the center of Avdivka, uh, the Russians have made some pushes and you can see that um, most of it is really in central, the center offensive of Avdivka. So a few days ago, it was still around these forested areas, really the beginning of the entrance of Avdivka. But now you can see that the Russians have started entering um, some other uh, parts, kind of the beginning of Avdivka. They've managed to cross some certain forested areas and some of the fighting is currently ongoing in these uh, this urban sort of these urban blocks um, south of the city of Avdivka if we're looking at it from this position. So this is sort of the southern part of Avdivka. So this is certainly concerning, but you guys must understand that 
there are not that many structures that are standing for the Ukrainians here. Everything is ruined, and the Russians are doing three different offensives. They're really squeezing from the north, sort of the south, um, and also the southwestern part of Avdivka. So it's a lot of pressure, um, and especially because, as I mentioned, the Ukrainians don't have that many ammunition that they can spare throughout the front line, so they have to sacrifice. That's what I've been saying, that Ukraine needs more Bradleys. We've seen how effective these... American Bradleys especially have been in the Vdivka, destroying T-90s and other Russian tanks, which the Russians are certainly using here. Um, and that is really going to relieve a lot of pressure because the Bradleys not only are very effective machines to destroy Russians in terms of their cannons, but they also protect the lives of Ukrainian soldiers. Very well protected machines. So that's the situation in Avdivka. The Russians have made some gains in the central part of Avdivka. So, um, you know, slowly the Russians are gaining momentum here, unfortunately. And the last thing I can update you guys on, which is not that big of a news, but the Russians managed, you know, to gain some territory close to Orozhaina. And the Ukrainians were able to drive the Russians back out of one of those fields. But this is really n nothing really uh, big, I should say. But it's still important and worthy of mentioning. So the Ukrainians were able to kind of counterattack and push the Russians out, uh, further out of Urozhaine, which was, you can see, these are the main Ukrainian gains from uh, the summer offensive um, last year. So that's the video for today, guys. Let me know what you think about Putin's decree that the sale of Alaska was illegal. I'm curious to hear your opinions. Um, also, let me know what you think about any of these map changes. Uh, let me know in the comment section. Again, if you enjoy my content, subscribe to my channel, like my video, and leave me a comment. Thank you so much, and I will see you guys in the next one. Slava Ukraini!